Mr. President, to come down to the floor today to discuss a very important issue to Montanans and many of my colleagues in the Senate, and that's the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It's also known as LWCF. I'm joined by friends and colleagues, in fact, the gentleman from North Carolina, Senator Burr, and the gentleman from Colorado, Senator Gardner, who, like me, know firsthand the importance of LWCF. And why we're here today is because in just a few short days, in fact, on September 30th, this program is going to expire. And without any action from Congress, a program that is widely supported, provides more access to public lands, conserves our important landscapes, and I think this is probably Senator Burr's favorite comments about LWCF, it costs the taxpayers nothing. I'll bet you hear that from him in a moment. That's going to expire. Of the many benefits provided by LWCF, the most important one to Montanans is making public lands accessible. In fact, I brought down a few maps of Montana to show you some of the challenges we have. This map shows all the public lands in our state. So anything that's colored is a public land. That's Forest Service, it's BLM, it's National Parks, Wildlife Refuges, and State Trust land. As you can see, there's a lot of public land in Montana. Now, our public lands help drive a $7 billion outdoor economy, creates tens of thousands of jobs, and it supplies about $300 million in state and local tax revenues. As an avid outdoorsman myself, I know firsthand the importance of our public lands. In fact, in August, back home in Montana, my wife and I did a 25-mile backpack in the Beartooth Wilderness, fly fishing at lakes above 10,000 feet. That is my idea of a great weekend in Montana. But public lands out of public reach benefit no one. In fact, this next map shows a portion of the eastern side of our state. In Montana, much of our public land is checkerboarded. You can see it a little better here because these checkerboards are sections. They're 640 acres, a square mile. This means that each one of those yellow squares are inaccessible, in many cases, to Montanans. In fact, this is BLM-owned. It's public land that, despite being owned by the federal government, cannot be accessed by the public. In fact, a recent study by the Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership and on XMAPS, this is a great Montana tech company, founded, it's Onyx, founded that there are 1.52 million acres of federal land in Montana alone that are inaccessible. I have that Onyx app on my phone. If you are a hunter, fisherman, outdoors in Montana, you oftentimes will have that app because it tells you exactly where you're at in where the lands are public and where the lands are private. Let me put this in context about the inaccessibility of our lands. In Montana, we have more inaccessible public lands to the people than the entire state of Rhode Island. It's about the size of Delaware, all of which Montanans are locked out of. And public land that is only open to a select few or none at all is really not public at all. The next map shows the western side of Montana where we see the same problem on Forest Service land. If you look here, you can see a piece of checkerboarded land that we are using LWCF dollars to expand public access. In fact, the Beaver Tail to Bearmouth Corridor is currently the highest ranking Forest Service LWCF project. This project unlocks approximately 1,900 acres of currently inaccessible public land. As you can see on this map, there are whole sections that Montanans are locked out of. This project, like many LWCF projects, ensures that our booming outdoor economy can continue to grow. It allows hunters, it allows anglers, and other sportsmen to have access to their public land. However, projects like this are in danger if we don't reauthorize LWCF. Luckily, very fortunately, there's been some good work done. In fact, recently, the House Natural Resources Committee passed a bill to permanently reauthorize LWCF. And I want to thank Congressman Gianforte and the House side from Montana and Chairman Bishop of Utah for getting that push through. The House has done their job. The Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee has also passed legislation to reauthorize LWCF. We now need to get this through the full House and the Senate, and we need to do that now. LWCF is a program that maximizes the value of public lands to the taxpayer, it boosts our outdoor economy, and it has strong bipartisan support. And Lord help us, we know we need some bipartisan bills right now in this city. That is why I stand up here today to urge my colleagues to act 
reauthorize this critical program. Now, Montana is not the only state that has greatly benefited from LWCF. I want to turn it over now to my colleague, truly one of the warriors in LWCF, the Senator from North Carolina, Senator Burr. Well, I'd like to thank Senator Baines and Senator Gardner for their critical support at backing this program. And if there's only one takeaway that anybody has from anything I say today, let it be this. This costs zero in taxpayer money. Zero. For those that are budget hawks, great bill. Back in June, the three of us, along with some of our colleagues, convened in front of the Capitol to commemorate the 100th day until LWCF expires. It's unfortunate that we are here today, less than a week away, from its expiration with no extension of this program. I believe we ultimately will win this fight because our colleagues know it's the right thing to do. As Senator Daines pointed out, the majority of the House of Representatives, the majority of the United States Senate is supportive of this. It costs zero in taxpayer money and it provides so much at the state and federal level. I appreciate my, po my colleagues' comments on public access. That's usually the focus of my LWCF monologues. But not a lot of my constituents are thinking about outdoor recreation right now. They're dealing with Hurricane Florence. And her aftermath is, you all know, North Carolina recently experienced a hurricane of epic proportion. Flooding has reached record levels. People's homes and businesses are in disrepair. And flood levels continue today at dangerously high levels in some areas. Obviously, much of this is unavoidable. But if we ensure our infrastructure is well positioned to deal with major influxes of water, we can minimize the devastating impact that we saw from Florence. And I'm not referring necessarily just to bridges, dams, and roads. I'm talking about our natural infrastructure. If we strategically create green spaces in our cities and in our river basins, we can mitigate some of the flooding. Guess what? LWCF dollars help us to do that. A great example is the South Cape May Meadows Preserve and the surrounding Cape May National Wildlife Refuge, which is an LWCF helped create this refuge in New Jersey. The state of New Jersey, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Nature Conservancy have worked together to restore wetlands, which now includes engineered structures, as well as natural features like marshes, dunes, and wetlands. This wetlands area has since withstood several major storms, including Hurricane Sandy, Irene. The wetlands was positioned in such a way that it was able to absorb enough of the impact and water to protect many of the surrounding communities. In 2016, a study by the Nature Conservancy in partnership with a risk modeler for the insurance industry showed that the marsh wetlands saved over $650 million in property damages during the Hurricane Sandy alone and reduced annual property losses by nearly 20% in Ocean City, New Jersey. You see, this isn't just about uh, protected lands and, and public access. It's about those things that we can do that provide a better community, a lower cost of insurance, a better way to mitigate some of nature's challenges. Well, yes, it, did I mention it's also a bird sanctuary? Did I mention it's a recreational destination? And it also serves as critical infrastructure in times of disaster like the one my state's dealing with today. More and more today, our civil engineers are incorporating these pieces of green infrastructure and at first glance, one would actually think they're for aesthetic reasons. In Charlotte, a series of greenways wind through the city. One of the greenways, Four Mile Creek Greenway, used an LWCF grant to develop the land into a multi-purpose area rather than actually acquisition of the land. It has trails winding through it. It's home to hundreds of different animal species, but it's also used for natural drainage. It absorbs the water. It slows down the water with the vegetation and the winding creek beds. 
Our cunning civil engineers have us thinking they're building a park, but what they're really building is a flood mitigation program. As you can see, LWCF is used for projects in our cities and in our rural areas, big and small projects. And ultimately, the biggest filters of water in North Carolina are our own natural, natural forest and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Healthy forests in these public lands help us to slow the flow of water, and, and we need those units to have the integrity so that they can do their job for feeding healthy river systems that are much less prone to that flooding. In conjunction with traditionally engineered um, structures, preserving strategic uh, pieces of land in their natural state or restoring others to better take the water saves us money in the long run. Ocean City, New Jersey proved that. I can go on for hours. I can go on with hundreds of examples. There aren't a lot of facts that I can give you about the program that I haven't already laid out in this and past opportunities to be on the floor. But I think it's useful to end my speech by restating the original mission laid out now 54 years ago when LWCF was created. Authorized for 25 years, reauthorized for 25 years, and then only author reauthorized for five. What do we want? We want permanent reauthorization program that has proven to be successful, regardless of your political views, a program that uses zero in taxpayer money, a program that produces benefits to every state in America that started with this mission statement, to assist in preserving, developing, and assuring accessibility to all citizens of the United States of America of present and future generations such quality and quantity of outdoor recreation resources as may be available and are necessary and desirable to strengthen the health and vitality of the citizens of the United States by one, providing funds for and authorizing federal assistance to states in planning, acquisition, and development of needed land and water areas and facilities, and two, providing funds for the federal acquisition and development of certain lands and other areas. I'm not sure you can sum it up any differently what the definition of a good program is, a successful program. It's not just in the mission statement, it's in the examples of what over those 54 years we have accomplished. There are not many things that I can walk away from and believe that my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren will be positively impacted by, but I can assure my colleagues of this, permanent reauthorization of LWCF is one of those things. And I am committed, along with my colleagues, to make sure that there is no temporary reauthorization, there is a permanent reauthorization, because we have met the burden of proof as to why this should never go away, and why the American people support it in overwhelming numbers. I'm grateful to my colleagues for their support, their time to be here, here on the floor today, and I yield back to Senator Daines. Thank you, Senator Burr. Senator Burr articulated very well, and I think it also demonstrates the diversity geographically. We have a senator from North Carolina, a senator from Montana, a senator from Colorado. It doesn't matter if you're a western state or state on the east side of our, of our nation. And I knew Senator Burr would talk about the fact it, casts, it costs the taxpayer nothing. I hear that all the time, and it says uh, members here who care deeply about uh, responsible stewardship of taxpayer dollars, it doesn't cost the taxpayer anything. There's another word I always hear from Senator Burr, it's the permanent reauthorization. This is no longer an experiment. <laughs> this is proven. This is why we need to move away from this temporary reauthorization and make it permanent. Now, I'm pleased to have another colleague of mine from Colorado, Senator Gardner, join me now. We'd be border states that weren't for the state of Wyoming, Senator Gardner. And uh, so he's down in the southern part of the Rockies, a, a beautiful state. And uh, I'm grateful to have you as one of the key champions here in the U.S. Senate, LWCF, uh, Senator Gardner. Thank you, Senator Daines, and uh, Mr. President, thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here to talk with my colleagues about the importance of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Over the past several months, uh, that uh, press conference that uh, Senator Burr referred to 
uh, marking 100 days until the expiration of Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, we've since come to the floor offering unanimous consent agreements. We've introduced legislation. We fought for amendments uh, to make sure that we extend not just temporarily, not just for a year or two, but to make sure that we fight for the permanent reauthorization of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. I was struck by uh, the words that Senator Burr said in particular uh, about the suffering of uh, his home state, North Carolina, in the aftermath of Hurricane Florence. Uh, and I was reminded of a quote that, uh, that Enos Mills, one of the, the founding fathers of Rocky Mountain National Park, said about our national, our national places and spaces. He said, within national parks, and I think you could apply this to public lands everywhere, the public parks, uh, national parks, forests, uh, you name it. Within national parks is room, glorious room, Room in which to find ourselves in, in which to think and hope, to dream and plan, to rest and to resolve. That's the importance of our public lands across the West, across the East, and everywhere in this country, from corner to corner, as we, as we fight to preserve our most sacred places. Uh, Senator Daines, uh, the, the, the valiant efforts in Montana to preserve our public lands, both of our states, public land states, where uh, in Colorado, if you add in the state and federal uh, public lands, uh, you're looking at nearly half of the state of Colorado. Uh, and of course, the numbers you laid out earlier, th these are important management issues, important issues to resolve. And then once in a while, there's a piece of, 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 of opportunity ahead of us to preserve a, a parcel of land, a, a portion of forest, a recreational opportunity for future generations. You know, uh, and, and we use the Land and Water Conservation Fund to do just that. Teddy Roosevelt said that there is delight in the hardy life of the open. He went on to say, the nation behaves well if it treats the national resource, natural resources as assets which it must turn over to the next generation increased in value and not impaired in value. And that's what the Land and Water Conservation Fund has allowed us to do. And I want to show you uh, a, a, a picture of an incredible, glorious space in Colorado that I visited just a few weeks back. This is the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park. It's pretty impressive. And I can tell you that if you're able to go down next to the Gunnison River and enjoy that opportunity to be alone, to be in that space, you indeed will live up to Enos Mills' quote, where you will be able to find that time to think and hope, to dream and plan, to rest and to resolve. But if you look at this canyon, you'll notice some of this, this, the, the uplands, the, the flats, the top of the rim of the canyon. And you would assume that that would have been a part of the National Park. But when they created the, the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park, there was a private inholding, and you can see part of it right here. Now imagine the risk to this great national park, this great public place that could be posed by somebody who decided that they wanted to develop that space. And all of a sudden, that great natural wonder, the great open space that this presents to not just the people of Colorado, but truly people around the world, would be gone, would be blemished, would be impaired. And so uh, we worked with the Land and Water Conservation Fund in bipartisan fashion. Senator Bennett, myself, Congressman Tipton, uh, we've had great bipartisan support within the Colorado congressional delegation. Congressman Lamborn, uh, Congressman Tipton, Congressman Kaufman, all who strongly support the Land and Water Conservation Fund. In this case, in the western slope of Colorado, Congressman Tipton, Senator Bennett, and I worked with the, the, worked with the, uh, the, the agencies in Colorado who do so much great work, the Conservation Fund in this case out of Boulder, Colorado, uh, to make a purchase of this private land using Land and Water Conservation Fund dollars. And if we go to the next, the next chart, you can see where that land was. This is Bruce Noble, the superintendent of the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park, and he's pointing that river is just right down here, and this is the land that the Land and Water Conservation Fund helped to purchase so that this asset will be preserved for future generations, not just for five years or ten years, but for as long as this great and hallowed nation exists. You will be able to come to the Black Canyon Gunnison, Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park and be at one with your thoughts, yourself, the opportunity to think, to resolve, to plan, to hope. That's the respite that this brings to all of us because we're better people knowing that some of our most wild and natural places exist in truly wild and natural spaces. 
And so uh, to, to, to the leadership of the Conservation Fund, Christine Quinlan and the other folks who worked with Land and Water Conservation Fund, thank you for making this possible. This is just one of many examples in Colorado. In fact, uh, over $268 million have been appropriated to Colorado through the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, to, to make purchases such as this. In a recreation economy in Colorado that's responsible for over 230,000 jobs in the state of Colorado alone, in an outdoor economy that's nearly $10 billion in wages and salaries, $2 billion in state and local tax revenues, uh, nearly $30 billion outdoor economy overall in Colorado. That's what Land and Water Conservation Fund is able to be a part of. So this isn't just about protecting our open spaces. It's not just about protecting these great sacred lands that we have but it's also about a thriving economy in Colorado, in Montana, in North Carolina. The opportunities we have to drive those outdoor economies with hundreds of thousands of jobs, billions of dollars in revenue. And this Congress, in a bipartisan fashion, passed legislation uh, to promote that outdoor economy. But it's all related back to this crown jewel uh, of our conservation programs, the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We're just days away from seeing uh, this clock tick uh, one day beyond uh, what it should and what we should allow. And I think one of the reasons why we're here uh, is because we heard the frustration of our voters back in uh, Colorado, North Carolina, and Montana who get frustrated with Washington and are probably wondering why something that everybody agrees with can take so long to get done. Because Washington seems to be the only place that the more people agree with it, the longer it takes to happen. And so let's fix that. The, the times that Senator Burr has come to the floor uh, with Democrats and Republicans alike to champion this, I truly am grateful for it. Senator Daines, thank you for your leadership. We have days left. We have hours remaining. We should work with every moment to make sure that we get this reauthorization, permanent reauthorization, full funding across the finish line. And it's an honor to be with my colleagues to fight for this great program. Senator Garner, thank you. And Senator Burr as well. This is... Uh this is something that I think for us is, is more than a, a, a policy discussion. You can see the passion from, uh, from each member here because it's a way of life. I, I come from a state in Montana where a mom or a dad, a grandpa or grandma can still load up that son or daughter or granddaughter or grandson in the pickup and go down to Walmart and buy an elk tag, a deer tag, over the counter and then head out and have access to public lands to hunt to fish. That makes America unique. You don't see that in most places around the world, and that sets us apart uh, as a unique people. It's, yeah, please. Senator, Senator Burr, yes. Because I want to I drive home what Senator Gardner said. This is not the first time we've been here. Uh, almost 100 days ago on that event we had outside, we came inside and moved to reauthorize Land and Water Conservation Fund. I just stepped, pulled out my drawer and found three instances. Uh, all of those speeches start. This time we're only 66 days until September 30th. This time today we're only 45 days. Today we're only 38 days till expiration. We continue to drive this with our colleagues. Why? Because the American public supports this program so much. Because this is effective and impactful in every community of every state in the country. And I know my colleagues agree with me, we're going to be relentless at how many times we come to the floor. Sometimes, uh, Senator Gardner, you, when you've been here as long as I have, you learn that sometimes you have to wear the people down that might find a reason to disagree with you. But you know, nobody's disagreed with us because it costs money. Nobody's disagreed with us because it wasn't effective. Maybe they disagree with us because they haven't utilized it like so many other Americans. I can't think of a legacy we can leave for generations to come than to permanently reauthorize that. And I believe it will happen this calendar year. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Thank you, Senator Byrne. That, that, that permanent reauthorization, I'll tell you why that's important. A place like Montana, Colorado, and North Carolina is because it takes time to put together some of these consolidations of checkerboard lands to make this all work. I mean, here's an example of that right here, where this is a project that was executed. And you see, we're not playing checkers here. This is the way the land management works out, oftentimes out west. 
And so to make that all happen, to get the parties, to get the state, to get the federal government, to get a private landowner together here, it sometimes takes years. What we don't need to have is the federal government back here, Congress, providing uncertainty about whether or not we're going to fund a process that oftentimes takes years to get the landowners, the state, and the feds together to uh, execute a consolidation that gives the public access to their public lands. And that's why permanent reauthorization is so important, to take that off the table. There's enough challenges already with LWCF and with trying to make these transactions work without having Congress get in the way. So I want to thank Senator Burr for your passion, uh, your steadfast commitment to the permanent reauthorization, and keep reminding us it costs the taxpayers nothing. It's pretty good value, I think. So again, I want to thank both my colleagues here. Uh, they've been strong leaders in this issue. We're going to keep fighting. Uh, as Senator Byrd just ticked down, went from 100 days, now we're down to four days. We're going to fight for LBCF at every opportunity we have. And we all urge our colleagues, listen to the stories you heard today. Listen to your constituents and join us in fighting to reauthorize to save LWCF. Thank you.